Let's take a look at the stealth fighter that should have been produced and still might be. The Northrop YF-23. The YF-23 was Northrop and McDonnell Douglas' entry into the Advanced Tactical Fighter or ATF competition, which went up against the Lockheed YF-22. Notable features of the YF-23 include twin angled tails, a trapezoidal shaped wing, underwing engine air intakes, and engine exhaust channels. Let's take a look at some key specifications for the YF-23. Length, 67 feet 5 inches. Wingspan, 43 feet 7 inches. Height, 13 feet 11 inches. Empty weight, 29,000 pounds. Maximum takeoff weight, 62,000 pounds. Maximum speed, classified, estimated to be above Mach 2 with a Mach 1.6 supercruise. Range, 2,424 nautical miles. Engines, each General Electric YF120 produces 23,500 pounds thrust dry or 35,000 pounds thrust with afterburner. Thrust to weight ratio, 1.36. In 1981, while the F-15 was still relatively new, the Air Force put forth a requirement for an aircraft to eventually replace both the F-15 and F-16. This was driven in advancements in Soviet air defenses along with increasing numbers of MiG-29s and Su-27 fighters. In what became known as the Advanced Tactical Fighter or ATF program, requirements included the use of advanced materials including composites, high performance with supercruise, and all aspects stealth technology. By 1986, the competition had been narrowed down to two competitors, Lockheed and Northrop. To build such an advanced airplane, Northrop teamed up with McDonnell Douglas, while Lockheed teamed up with Boeing and General Dynamics. This resulted in two design submissions, Lockheed's YF-22 and Northrop's YF-23. Additionally, General Electric and Pratt & Whitney each developed an engine which would be used in both designs, the engines being designated the YF-120 and YF-119 respectively. And while the two designs both met the competition's requirements of survivability, supercruise, stealth, and ease of maintenance, they each had very different design philosophies. Seen as more conventional, it's not hard to view the YF-22 as an evolution of the F-15 with both utilizing twin vertical tails, horizontal stabilizers, and side air intakes. Meanwhile, the YF-23 was a more cutting-edge design, with a trapezoidal-shaped wing and an all-moving V-tail which performed double duty as a horizontal and vertical stabilizer. One interesting feature of the YF-23 was the way in which it solved the boundary layer air problem. Boundary layer air is important to engine performance as during certain flight regimes, the air can move at a different speed and even direction, potentially causing reduced engine performance or even an engine flameout in certain conditions. This becomes more pronounced at supersonic speeds. Traditionally, splitter plates were used to separate air from the fuselage and the intake, but this solution is not very stealthy. The YF-23 had to be both stealthy and have the ability to supercruise, which posed some major design challenges. The engineers at Northrop came up with a brilliant two-part solution. The first component was the use of S-shaped air ducts, which slowed down the airflow getting to the engines as well as hid the turbine fan blades from radar, thereby reducing the radar cross-section or RCS. Additionally, the intakes were situated one engine fan diameter below and to the side of the engine, further ensuring that radar beams would not detect the fan blades as there was no direct line of sight to the blades. The second component involved the use of small holes that were drilled out of the fuselage to ingest the boundary air layer before it could enter the air intake. The ingested air would then be automatically vented out of the top of the aircraft. This solution became known as the boundary layer control system and can be seen as panels under the fuselage just before the air intake. Aircraft such as the Eurofighter and Super Hornet both use a similar solution, 
but the YF-23 was the first to integrate the holes into the fuselage. Interestingly, the F-22 still uses splitter plates but with radar absorbent coatings to offset the disadvantage. While stealth aircraft are inherently difficult to detect on radar, their infrared or heat signatures usually are easier to detect and lock onto. To reduce this infrared heat signature, the YF-23 made use of heat absorbent line channels or troughs where the engine's exhaust flowed. And while this greatly reduced the IR signature of the aircraft, it did make the installation of thrust vectoring nozzles such as those found on the YF-22 not possible. Another somewhat overlooked feature was the contributions of the V-tail. The V-tail surfaces were quite large. In fact, each tail section is larger than an F-5's wing and almost as large as an F-18's wing. These tail surfaces could rotate plus or minus 40 degrees and effectively acted as secondary wings allowing the YF-23 to perform extreme maneuvers without the use of thrust vectoring. The cockpit of the YF-23 was situated high and forward on the fuselage to provide the pilot with better visibility and featured a side throttle along with the center stick and some of the most advanced fly-by-wire computer systems of its time. Unlike the YF-22's side and underneath weapons bays, the YF-23 placed all of its weapons bays underneath the fuselage. While larger than the YF-22's base and capable of carrying large air-to-ground munitions, which presented risks since missiles had to be stacked on top of missiles and a reliable weapon egress solution would have to be developed. In contrast, the YF-22's bays were simpler to operate and by extension posed less of a risk in developing. And finally, to save on costs, the YF-23 prototypes were built using the nose wheel landing gear of an F-15, the main landing gear from the F-A-18 Hornet, and some cockpit components from the F-15E Strike Eagle. By 1990, a fly-off between the YF-22 and the YF-23 had begun. For the competition, two YF-23 prototypes were used. The first was known as Prototype Air Vehicle 1 or PAV-1 and was painted charcoal gray and nicknamed Black Widow 2 after the World War II era Northrop P-61 Black Widow. PAV-1 was powered by the Pratt & Whitney F-119 engine and first flown in August of 1990, and was piloted by Alfred Paul Metz. Interestingly, for a brief time PAV-1 had a red hourglass painted on the underside such as those found on a Black Widow Spider. The second prototype, known as PAV-2, was painted in lighter grays and nicknamed Grey Ghost. PAV-2 was powered by the General Electric YF-120 engine and first flew in October of 1990, while being piloted by Jim Sandberg. Thus began the now infamous competition between the YF-22 and the YF-23. The ATF competition would now enter its final phase. Along with the Air Force, the ATF competition initially had input from the Navy, which was undergoing its own Navy Advanced Tactical Fighter, or NATF program. The idea was to replace the F-14 Tomcat with a fifth-generation stealth fighter that could operate out of carriers. While the prototype version of the YF-23 was not seen as carrier-ready, several concepts were envisioned. At the same time, a navalized version of the YF-22 was also considered. And while the Navy withdrew from the NATF competition in 1992, many speculate that the YF-23's advantage and range would have likely gone a long way in the Navy's selection process. Performance-wise, the YF-23 design was faster and more stealthy. While the YF-22 was slightly more maneuverable at low speeds, possibly due to thrust vectoring. The YF-22 was also generally seen as less of a risk when it came to manufacturing costs. And in 1991, the YF-22 with the Pratt & Whitney engine combination were chosen as the winner of the ATF competition. So, why did the YF-22 beat the YF-23? In a debate that still goes on to this day, Many have felt that the YF-23 was the better airplane and should have won the competition. Essentially, you could say it came down to public relations. The Lockheed team conducted a demonstration flight of a high angle of attack maneuver, while the Northrop team decided not to do so. And even though the YF-23 could perform the same maneuver, by not demonstrating it the implication was that the YF-22 could perform the maneuver, while the YF-23 could not. Additionally, although not a requirement of the test program, the Lockheed team also conducted a live fire exercise of an AIM-9 Sidewinder and an AIM-120 AMRAM missile from the internal weapons bay. This was seen as going above and beyond what was necessary for testing and made a favorable impression upon the evaluators. 
There are many other theories as to why the Y of 23 lost. Some include concerns over the Y of 23's unconventional design, which would have led to cost overruns in production as issues were resolved. Not to mention the cost overruns which had been associated with the B-2 Spirit Bomber. In the end, some lawmakers felt that Lockheed was more reliable and ready to begin production on the YF-22, where the perception was that Northrop may have needed more time. As the YF-22 went on to become their production F-22 Raptor, the two YF-23 prototypes, Black Widow and Grey Ghost, were put away and now reside in museums. And lastly, although planned for 350 flights, only 50 combined flights were flown between PAV-1 and PAV-2. How much more could have been learned had 350 flights been flown? To this day, many still consider the YF-23 way ahead of its time, 30 years after it first flew. Today there are rumors that the USAF is already flying a 6th generation platform. Could this be based on the YF-23? Some concept art that has been shown appears to validate this. Additionally, Japan is already working on its own 6th generation fighter, designated the F-3. After years of internal studies, Japan has reached out to other corporations to assist with its development of the 6th generation fighter. One such company that has responded was Northrop Grumman, and there is speculation that it could offer a modernized version of the YF-23 to Japan. In an era of global uncertainty and increasing tensions, it may be time for the Black Widow to take to the skies once more. What do you think? Should the YF-23 have been built? Is it being worked on today? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, go ahead and subscribe and click the bell for notifications. If you'd like to support this channel, consider Patreon where you will get exclusive behind the scenes photos and video clips. Stay safe and see you next time.